the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real world practice. Hello listeners. Wanted to let you know that we are going to run the top three best of podcasts for 2023 over the next few weeks. I handpicked three of the top 10 based on number of listens, and I hope you enjoy our reruns. Please look for updates on PAOS and a review of our annual practice and salary survey, which will be coming up soon. Welcome today, Dr. Silverberg, Dr. Silverberg's radiologist out of Charlotte. And he recently gave a talk at our Charlotte meeting about trauma imaging. I'm so excited to have him on the podcast today. Just for a point of reference, there will be some images posted on our YouTube channel. So when you're listening to the podcast, if you'd like to see some images that kind of correlate to the topics we're discussing, please tune into that. So Dr. Silverberg, welcome. Honestly, it's been fantastic working with you guys in general. Uh, so I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, thanks so much. We're, we're excited to have you here. So you went through some of the technical aspects of MRI, and I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. I actually, in a former life, was an x-ray tech, and I did CT scans. And I think it would be helpful uh, for some of our listeners. I know a lot of our listeners know some of this, but could you explain the differences between, uh, before we get to the magnets, the sagittal, coronal, and axial imaging? And, you know, do you use all three planes when you're looking at something and kind of what's the purpose of that? Sure, that's, a, that's a great question. So those are just kind of put simply imaging terms, which correspond to anatomic planes of the body. So the coronal plane is essentially equivalent to the frontal plane or looking at the patient from the front. The sagittal plane is a lateral longitudinal plane looking at the patient from the side. And the axial plane is equivalent to the transverse plane or looking at the patient from the bottom of the feet and looking up towards their head. Um, you know, in terms of uh, using planes, it, it's sort of a, a tricky question because in general, whether or not MRIs perform these planes or include these planes when you order a study, the answer is a general yes, but it's important to know kind of where MRI protocols are designed. And MRI protocols for musculoskeletal imaging are typically designed by the responsible musculoskeletal radiologist. There's no muscular radiologist that a general radiologist may do it, or they may copy it from articles or copy those protocols from institutions. Most protocols in general have three planes. In my opinion, we should always have three planes in uh, MRI MSK protocols. Um, there's this concept of, uh, or a saying that one view is sometimes as good as not having any view at all. And the reason that's relevant is that, you know, sometimes, you know, patients move in MRI or the images may be degraded in one plane. And if you're reliant on a single plane, sometimes, you know, you might not be able to make the diagnosis if you're only comfortable with that one plane. So in general, um, it's really important to get comfortable with all three planes and then to include all three planes in your analysis, because it'll just make you that better at not only picking up pathology, but making the correct diagnosis. So, you know, locally, wherever uh, you practice, it, it's really up to the radiologist at that institution, at that site. But in general, three planes are standard and three planes should be utilized when you're going through a study yourself. Great. Thank you for that. That's uh, so important that you understand that. And then as our listeners understand that, you can start talking about, you know, the soft tissue contrast and image sequencing. And just like that, I segue into the next little bit. Um, can you please uh, just tell us a little bit about the T1, T2 magnets and fat saturation and, and just some of the technical stuff uh, that would be helpful for people to know? Sure. So um, when we look at MRI, you know, we, we have to kind of assess out why we use MRI as the workhorse of musculoskeletal imaging. And the primary reason is in the ability of MRI to create soft tissue contrast. And what I mean by that is soft tissue contrast is the ability to tell two different substances apart when they're directly next to each other in an image. If you think of x-ray, when you look at the soft tissues on x-ray, you can kind of tell where muscle is. Sometimes you can't really tell where you know subcutaneous fat starts and ends all the time because they're similar in color. Bones stand out because they're a totally different color. So think of using black ink on white paper when we write something. The black ink stands out against white paper because the contrast difference is so great. 
If we used white ink on white paper, there would be no contrast to see the ink. Now replace the ink with tissues like fat, water, muscle, or proteinaceous material. Um, if those individual tissue types are assigned a different color, we can tell them apart, and therefore we have great soft tissue contrast. And that's really what MRI does well. Uh, the way we do that is through sequences. The way we create soft tissue contrast is through sequences. And to simplify it, and, and I think for for the purposes of just di making diagnosis, it really there's no need to have a complex understanding of it. But we're able to create our own soft tissue contrast the use of these sequences to diagnose things. And um, the the most common sequences that we use are divided into two main categories: fluid sensitive and T1. Fluid sensitive has many subtypes and many names. You, you've probably heard of T2, STIR, proton density. But for purposes of, of evaluating images, it's better to just talk about them as fluid sensitive and T1. Those two categories really simplify everything and everything will fall into those two categories. Um, as I mentioned, they're, they're you know, ways of creating contrast. So on a fluid sensitive sequence, just based on the name, we assign fluid the color of white, or sometimes we say bright. On T1, we assign, we assign fluid as a black color. So it's you can see already if when on one you know sequence fluid sensitive something is bright and on the other sequence of T1 it's dark we've created different contrasts contrasts already and that can be helpful in certain scenarios depending on what we're looking for if we're not looking for fluid a T1 can be very helpful if we are looking for fluid a T2 or stir or any fluid sensitive sequence can be helpful so kind of focusing on broad categories it's also not important to know what every single substance looks like and what its contrast or what color assignment it has in a particular sequence. It really kind of boils down to four things in most skeletal imaging. Fluid, which we talked about, you know, is bright on fluid sensitive and it's dark on T1. Fat, which is bright on both T1 and fluid sensitive, so it doesn't matter. You can just think fat is always bright. Cortical bone, again, same on, on fluid sensitive or T1. It's dark on any sequence. And so our goal is to use the sequence that creates the best soft tissue contrast and assigns pathology one color and normal tissue a totally different color. And when I say color, I mean from white to black and all the shades of gray in between. That is really the strength of MRI. So, so kind of going back to the white ink on white paper analogy, if we can't see something, if pathology is assigned the same color as normal tissue in a given sequence, we won't see it. It will be occult because it'll be zero contrast. Tendons are a great example. So for example, tendons are dark on MRI regardless of the sequence. And again, I don't want to go take too much time on this question, but I think this is this is great for just understanding MRI and also using it to diagnose things. Tendons are dark on MRI. doesn't matter the sequence, T1 or fluid sensitive. But when tendons tear, there's hemorrhage and edema that dissects through the site of the tear and the tendon. Fluid is bright on a fluid sensitive sequence and hemorrhage and edema contain a lot of fluid. So therefore, in a fluid sensitive sequence, the pathology in a tear will be bright. It's nice that the tendon in itself is dark on all sequences. So we get a bright pathologic finding of that fluid on a dark background of tendon. And we've created excellent soft tissue contrast to make that diagnosis. Um, there is something important to mention, however, and that is fat saturation, which we kind of alluded to. So I mentioned that fat is bright on fluid sensitive and T1. So if you think about it, there are a lot of tendons that sit right next to subcutaneous fat or next to the inch medullary fat and bone when they're attached to bone. That can that bright T1 fat, you know, or bright, excuse me, bright signal uh, in fat on a T2 weighted sequence or on a fluid sensitive sequence can appear just like a tear in tendon. So if we can get rid of that bright signal in fat, then the tendon tear stands out. Again, if we have two bright things next to each other, we can't tell them apart. So we apply fat saturation to get rid of the signal, the bright signal that fat gives us in images. So oftentimes fluid sensitive sequences are fat saturated, meaning we've taken out the signal, we've taken out the bright signal that fat is assigned and we assign them dark. And that really helps to bring out things that might be living in that bright structure that will be also bright on a fluid sensitive sequence. So again, a tendon is our example. If a tendon is torn, it's typically bright on a fluid sensitive sequence. If it happens to be next to something that decays fat, we want to get rid of that brightness that fat presents so we can see that bright signal in the tendon tear better. Um, a bone contusion is a similar example. You know, if the medullary fat and bone is bright, is bright, 
if we get rid of it, we can see edema in bone, which is again, edema being fluid is also bright on a fluid sensitive sequence. So fat saturation is just yet another technique we have to improve our soft tissue contrast. Um, you know, again, not to, to bog people down, but really when you look at MRI, the key is to think what sequence am I looking at and what is bright on this sequence? What is dark on this sequence? And then you can sort of understand what pathology looks like and what normal looks like. And I think that's the thing to focus on with those categories really being the, the most common, fluid, fat, blood, and uh, what normal structures look like, like tendons being dark. Got it. I mean, that's a great explanation for everybody. I, I hope everybody listens to this entire thing, but that provides so much clarity. Uh, one question, what does a meniscus look like? I mean, how can you see a meniscus tear? Sure. So um, we're, we're lucky in that tendons, fibrocartilage, and ligaments, fibrocartilage being menisca and labra, are dark on all sequences. So it's nice because the normal state, a normal meniscus, is going to be dark. Now, do we use fluid sensitive or do we use T1? That's a little bit complex, but to simplify it, you really don't want to use a T1 to diagnose fibrocartilage pathology. The reason being is that they're sensitive, but they're actually too sensitive, meaning that we would overcall pathology more than we'd be right. They, they, we would get so many false positives using a T1 to diagnose fibrocartilage or tendon or, or uh, ligament pathology that we really ought not to use them. Fluid sensitive is the workhorse for really pathologic imaging. And that's honestly why, or, or also why um, the fluid sensitive sequences are sometimes called the pathology sequences because the you know most fluid states are associated with hemorrhage or fluid or edema. So if, if all of those things are composed of some fluid you know, uh, substrate, it's really going to show up best in a fluid sensitive sequence. So in terms of menisci, when we're evaluating them on a fluid sensitive sequence, we're looking for bright signal in that normal dark background. And that bright signal, again, typically being a tear, if we have uh, a meniscal tissue and a tear occurs, well, the tear occurs in a joint and a joint has joint fluid. That fluid often will extend into the tear itself or dissect into the tear. And that's why we see that bright signal within a tear. In menisci, in terms of criteria, it's also important to realize what makes up and what, what counts as a tear and what does not count as a tear. When we look at an image, say the going back to our planes, our sagittal plane to evaluate a meniscus, if we see signal in the meniscus that touches an articular surface, it could be the superior part of the meniscus or the inferior part of the meniscus, on a single image, that actually has a low sensitivity and specificity for a tear. It's around 30%, I believe, in the lateral meniscus and slightly higher than the medial meniscus. However, if we see that bright signal going to an articular surface, again, superior inferior surface, on more than two sequences or two, excuse me, two images, that has a very high sensitivity and specificity. And what's very important is that that doesn't have to be two contiguous images, meaning it doesn't have to be two adjacent sagittal slices. It doesn't have to be two adjacent coronal slices. You could have one sagittal image where the, the abnormal bright signal in that dark meniscus goes to an articular surface and a similar finding on one coronal image that constitutes as two images, you know, to get our high sensitivity specimens for a meniscus. So to, to answer your question, a meniscus should be dark in all sequences. We want to use a fluid sensitive sequence to diagnose a tear and a tear will be bright on that fluid sensitive sequence, reaching the articular surface on more than one image. Awesome. Awesome. I, I think a lot of our folks, you know, we look for disc herniations, we look for rotator cuff tears, we look, you know, labral tears and such. So that's very helpful to understand how, you know, how you look at it. How would you uh, kind of know that maybe there's a tear? Dr. Silverberg, thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you guys. And I really appreciate it. On behalf of your PAOS board of directors, we wish you all a safe and happy holiday season. 